Well, good to see many faces today. Appreciate you all making it. I know we got some people on a spring break vacation, so some of the folks are, are gone. Um, and again, I guess I didn't realize that we don't have Sunday school uh, on Easter Sunday. So we won't be here two weeks from today, which will be a perfect break because I don't that we're just about ready to finish this up. I know I said I was only going to do this for like two or three weeks, this 24, 2024 countdown. <laughs> I had one lady, because it's on YouTube, and I just leave it open. Well, I'm going to have to read you some of these comments. Some of these people's comments are like, wow. Um, this one lady said, I really like your teaching, but what do you mean countdown 2024? <laughs> it's like, well, it's oh my gosh. it's just kind of the whole thing. It's uh, There's a lot going on in the world, and uh, it's always good to be aware and prepared. So, um, well, again, like I said, we started at the key scripture for all of end times is Daniel 9, because that's where Jesus tells the disciples go. And, I mean, I had one person even comment that Daniel 9 doesn't even apply to, to end times. And it's like, uh, then why did Jesus tell the disciples to go back to Daniel chapter 9 when he's talking, when they're asking about the parousia. So it's like, well, just we all, we all need to be more, more, studi more studious. But the reason I studied is, number one, I want to deepen my walk with Christ. I want my personal relationship to be growing because, honestly, that is the key area the devil wants to hit you at. He wants you to do anything except spend quality, quantity time with your Savior in the Word. That, that'll be the first thing that starts to fall off um, when, when he's attacking you. Um, secondly, I want to be ready and equipped to faithfully serve the Lord no matter what the day may bring. Um, I mean, honestly, I could see the day in America where it gets very tough to name the name of Christ, um, and, and th they will come after you. And thirdly, <clears throat> I want to be motivated to use my spiritual gift in order that I don't stand at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, uh, where, where our works are, are checked out. I don't want to stand there empty-handed. Um, that will be a very, very rough thing to do. So this, what I want to do to finish these things up, I want to talk about uh, this part of it today. And you're probably thinking, is this the investment survey part of the, of, of the end times? No, this isn't the investment money part of it. What this is, is a story about Zacchaeus. Sometimes, you know, you hear these stories um, or you read the stories and you get very familiar with them, but you, but you start to lose the context of why Jesus brought that up. <laughs> And, and this was an interesting thing. Now, remember, this is the last week before Jesus' crucifixion. So everything this last week, is, is it would be good to go back through it slower, more carefully, because he is not going to waste his words. He's not going to waste time. So this is what happens as he's um, entering into Jericho. Jesus entered Jericho when was passing through, Luke 19. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. I know we've all heard about him. He was the chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very, very, very rich. He was seeking to see Jesus, and he was not able because of the crowd, for was he was small in stature. Okay, we're all familiar with that. He was a wee little man. Yeah, wee little man. <laughs> you can tell who was in Bible drill. <laughs> they didn't teach this stuff in the Catholic Church, I tell you. It was bad. No little catchy phrases or nothing. When Jesus came to that place, the place where Zacchaeus climbed up the tree, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down, for I must stay at your house today. Now, I'm sure Jesus knew of Zacchaeus. I'm sure Zacchaeus had might have heard uh, even Jesus teach before, or he had heard enough about this man that he, he, was, he was going to do anything he could to seek out a, a view or a perspective of Christ. You got to really a admire his heart not to give up and to be very creative to get a, get a view of Jesus. Today, salvation has come to this house. He is also a son of Abraham. Now, um, the people, when they heard that, they started to grumble. People started to get pretty uptight. I mean, here's Jesus saying, you know, hey, look, here's the chief of the IRS agent, and he's the one that's shaking down all the businesses and charging people too much, and everybody knew it. But as long as he paid a few pockets, they would allow him to do it. And so everybody started to get a bit um, intimidated or upset that Jesus had openly accepted Zacchaeus. But then Zacchaeus, of course, made that statement, you know, half of everything I own, I'll give away to the poor. And if I've defrauded anybody, come see me. I'll pay you four times what you said I took. 
um, th that was a clear indication that his heart had been changed. So you know God had been working on his heart. But here's the other thing that, that was interesting that happened. Jesus gives a parable or a story right after this event. So they've, they've seen Zacchaeus. They've seen how, how, how good he is at making money at other people's expense. And then they've seen his changed heart. And then Jesus gives this testimony about the 10. He calls in the 10 servants. Uh, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself anointed king and then return. Calling in 10 of his servants, he gave them each 10 minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. I think Jeff touched on this the last week about uh, receiving, receiving the talents or receiving the sum of money. Um, and this was so interesting. That word there in the Greek is where we get our English word pragmatic from, which is very unusual. Um, it's pragmatia. And, and it was a mercantile term. And it meant trade to gain. It meant <clears throat> exchange or leverage one thing for something else. Make a legitimate game, gain. Use this to earn more money. Uh, invest in trading until I come. And so you have the whole thing with Zacchaeus, the whole thing with, with the money. And then Zacchaeus, of course, uh, believes in the Messiah, uh, and then he gives half of his money away, and then Jesus tells the people about this parable, and I mean, uh, of course, be good in your business, whatever business you, you, you can do, actually, you, you know, you have to make a profit, but Jesus is always going further than that. Whatever spiritual gift you have, you need to know it, and that, next week, I will wrap up this whole 2024 prophecy. Um, and we'll go over spirit, each of the spiritual gifts individually. I know, I think Jeff kind of touched on them um, while he's been teaching on that. But I wanted to go over them a little bit more specifically and give you definitions of each one, where they're found in Scripture, um, and, and how you can know if you have this gift or you don't have this gift. But the reason it's so important and the reason it relates to the second coming, to the parousia of Christ, um, is that is what's going to happen shortly after he comes back. And so many Christians are going to be caught completely off guard in regards to, I didn't know there was a final exam. I didn't know there was a, an exit interview uh, from earth and where Jesus will review all of your work as a, as a Christian and see what you did. You know, everybody's motivated by something, okay? Some goals are grand, others may be just common. Uh, some are inward desires, others are outward glory. Uh, anybody recognize what, what grand trophy that is? Stanley Cup, absolutely. How about this one? Olympic gold medal. That was pretty easy there. You could read it. Um, this one? I'm telling you, there, there, there is a Speed Cubers tournament, and it is massive to win this trophy. So, anyways, um, how about this one? Yep, college football, national championship. Some of you are like, I have no idea what that is. Uh, every trophy, every reward, every recognition on this side of heaven has the same flaw. They're temporal. That is the problem. That We spend so much of our life to gain trophies or to, to acquire, and it's all going to end up in a box for a quarter at the Goodwill store. It, it, is, it is amazing what we spend our life so much on. All people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, 1 Corinthians 9, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Now, Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. The Corinthians, every two years, they would have their Isthminian games because there's an isthmus that connects uh, the two parts of, of Corinth. Anyways. Every two years, they would have kind of like their mini Olympics, but it was it was a huge, huge event, and the the reason Corinth was so strategic and why why Paul went there was well, definitely it's it sits on a crossroad and you, it's a maritime port, so you get these people in from all over the world, and there was a strong uh, Jewish presence there. Presence there, so Paul that was one reason Corinth was so strategic. But when he's talking to them about about running your race and about living your life 
and using your spiritual gift. This is what he's referring to. So they, they would key into this instantly. Everyone who enters an athletic competition contest practices self-control in everything. They do it to win a wreath that withers away. They would get this little leaf-plated uh, thing they'd wear on their brow, and they would wear that, and that would tell everyone th that I am the best, I'm the one. But we win, we run to win a crown that is eternal. And I, I don't think we give this enough thought. Um, I don't think we, we analyze our ministry enough to realize that, am I winning the race in what God wants me to be doing? Are we investing in the eternal? So here's the eternal mindset. The Christian life uh, can be very challenging, very painful. Uh, when you sign up to be a Christian, uh, instantly you're going to have competition. <laughs> you're going to have battles. You're going to have struggles. Therefore, we do not lose heart. This verse is becoming more and more <laughs> aware every day. Though outwardly we are wasting away. And the, the word there, it means to be spoiled, spoiled completely. Um, it, it means to be, Jesus uses the same word, wasting away, when he's talking about where thieves break in and steal, and then what moths come in and nibble. This is, the, this is the context of this word. The life is just nibbling away at your strength. Uh, the vigor you had when you were 16, 20, 30, no longer there. You need to invest in the kingdom while you still have physical strength because your body is wasting away. I think all of us could probably say amen to that. Amen. Yeah, that's all <laughs> Yet inwardly, but see, this is the wasting away part is obvious. We're all wasting away. I mean, strength fades, beauty fades, health fades. It's all going to fade, and you're all going to, you know, we all end up back into the ground. But inwardly, are we being renewed day by day? That is the key. Because if you become so obsessed with the wasting, you're missing the inward renewing. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The Lord puts a high premium on being faithful with the spiritual gifts that he's entrusted to you. He wants you to be able to know that gift. He wants you to be able to, to, to develop that gift and use that gift in the body of Christ. I mean, and really the Sunday school class, um, it is probably the best place to try to develop that gift because gifts relate to people and you have to have a relationship you have to build relationship with people to be able to invest into their life we are exhorted to win to gain to store up rewards do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy thieves break in matthew 6 but the emphasis is make sure you're storing up make sure you're treasuring up for yourself treasures in heaven Store up, the word means to treasure, to amass, to hoard, to store away for future use. Uh, I mean, sometimes I don't think like that. Sometimes I'm just thinking here and now, and I'm, I'm losing sight of the eternal perspective that, you know, within probably 100 years, every one of us will be gone. So the question is, how wisely am I using my life and the gifts, especially the spiritual gifts that have been given to me? Um, my dad gave me some advice one time. Well, what he was, what he was talking about is that my parent, my dad was in the Air Force, so we grew up all over the world, and they had collected some very nice things. I mean, not filthy rich by any means, but just some nice things, some paintings. They, they liked antique art and stuff like that. And so since, since they traveled the world, they picked up these pieces. But what was so nice about them is that they would tell us the story about that piece. Where were we when, we when we first saw it, what we were doing, what we were up to, what was going on in the world at that time? In other words, each piece had a whole story related to it. <clears throat> and so you have five children. Well, all five of us have heard the same stories over and over, and all five of us want this item because we love that story. I mean, it may not have much value, but it was the stories. It was a reminder. So my dad, in his wisdom, he said, look, I want to, I want to hire you for however, however long it takes. I want you to get everything inventoried and appraised, and then I want you to have it all figured out. You talk to the four other siblings, and you figure out what everybody wants. You know, because and, and I said, send me your list. Everybody's list was the exact same thing. <laughs> he was like, oh, 
I said, okay, well, you can't have that because of this, and then this person wants this. And anyways, after two years, we got all that worked out because what dad didn't want to have happen, he didn't want our, he didn't want the, our family to turn into a WWF, a wicked and wild family where, where everything, as soon as the parents die, everything turns into a, a scattering fish food in the tank. And th he, he didn't want that to take place. So he wanted, and, and, and I, I thought it was a very wise perspective that he has because I've seen a lot of families ripped up by that. Uh, but basically what he was saying was, do your giving while you're living so you know in where it's going. And I just never, never forgot that. It just made so much sense. But you can also apply that in the spiritual realm too. No, do your giving, do your serving now while you have the strength while you still can function because you know where it's going to be going. There's going to be treasures, rewards amassed. So this is a little chart just to kind of give you um, how this whole thing's work. Because see, basically everything glorifies God. Everything he has created in this entire universe, including us, is, is meant to glorify him, to bring him honor and, and please him. For from him, through him, to him are all things, to him be glory forever. So then he works to open our eyes, to trust the Savior, then he wants us to grow. By this, my Father's glorified that you bear much fruit, so you prove to be my disciples. He wants us to grow, to use our spiritual gift, be investing them into other people. And he, he gives us, through the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts that are unique to you. Now, people can have the same spiritual gifts. That's not the problem. But nobody will use your gift like you just like you, because you have different experiences, different backgrounds, uh, all those things, all those things are part of your makeup. It's, it's not that you have to have all the background to use the gift, but the way you use the gift is going to be different because of who you are. That's the beauty of it. So he gives us spiritual gifts, and then if we use them, he'll reward us for that which again just brings him more glory. We lay those crowns, we will lay those honors down before him. They will be used in worship. And all of, all of that just goes right back to glorifying God again. I mean, it's all focused upon Jesus. So that, that, that's why spiritual gifts are so important. And a lot of churches don't even touch on spiritual gifts. They, they really don't. They, they don't encourage it. They, they, don't, they don't even teach it at all. Any questions, comments at this point? So, the body of Christ needs your spiritual gift. That's the other revelation. You are unique. You have special giftings from the Spirit of God. The, and you're in this church at this time in your life, in history, because there are people who need what you have been gifted in by God. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Second thing is you will give a complete account for how you used, how you invested, how you, you traded for gain, so to speak, your gift. Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat, the bema seat of Christ or of God, Romans 14, 10. So then, let, so then each of us will give a personal account. Uh, the Greek word there is lego, but it means a laying forth, a word. You're going to explain uh, to yourself to the Lord. That's an absolute certainty. So as much as I want the Lord to come back, I also have to be cognizant of the fact that when he does come back, that we're going to have a sit-down interview. And, and that, in Paul's mind, he equated that so much that it reminded him of the fear of God. To be aware of, of the return would also bring about this, this judgment time. This Again, we're not talking about sin. That's been dealt with at the cross, praise God. We're talking about your ministry, your service, okay? So remember, the three areas where you're going to be judged, quality, he, you are his servants, and the Lord has assigned you a task. Your ministry will be shown for what it is because the day, again, referring to the day that Christ comes back, will bring it to light. Your service will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality of your work. Did you labor well? If what you have built survives, and if it passes the test, you will receive your reward. But if it's burned up, you will suffer loss. You will be saved, of course, but only as one escaping through the flames. And the illustration is there, um, you know, your, your house is on fire in the middle of the night. You're not grabbing boxes, gathering stuff up. You're getting your kids, your wife, 
yourself out of the house as fast as you can and deal with the other stuff later. That's the imagery there. Y yes, Paul's clarifying, you know, we're not talking about salvation, but we're talking about losing rewards. Um, there was a, I think, oh gosh, I think it was in 96, there was a commercial that Nike did, and it was all these basketball players, just kind of black and white clips, just basketball shoot being shot, stuff like that. No, no, no talking, uh, no track, except for the very last line, which was, and he shoots the basket, the basket goes through, the ball goes through, and the line comes on and says, I think, you don't win silver, you lost the gold. I thought, that's interesting, because we think of gold, silver, you know, copper, bronze, whatever. It's like, no, if with the silver, it, 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 you didn't win the silver, you lost the gold. I thought, I don't want to stand there, in a sense, getting silver uh, instead of when I could have had the gold. Uh, your motivation, why do you do what you do? You know, if, if you're a giver, uh, how many people do you tell about it? <laughs> uh, if, 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 you, if you're doing it because it brings attention to you and it makes people think well of you, so you do it quite openly, I mean, again, it is much better to serve quietly. Now, it doesn't mean people can't know what you do. Um, I mean, obviously, I try to teach. Um, it's not that people don't know that, but it's what's the motive of my heart? Um, and, and, the, and that, boy, that'll be a Blu-ray, high def, laid up on the big screen. Uh, that'll all be there. It'll all be up there. And the last thing is faithfulness. You know, that's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. How distracted are you right now from using your spiritual gift? What's distracting you from using your spiritual gift? Are you being faithful to, to study, to learn, to look for opportunities? Um, I never really wanted to be a teacher. That wasn't what I, I don't like crowds. I don't like being in front of people. So that was not what I was thinking, but the Lord had a different thought. And that was the one that counts. Um, any questions on that? Quality, motivation, faithfulness? I, I'm sure glad it didn't say quantity. That, that, that would be a disaster, you know, um, that, because then everybody would be going for numbers. Everybody would be going for bigger is better, and that's not what the Lord is saying at all. He, it's, it's the quality. Uh, are people learning? Are they growing? Are they spiritually maturing? Are, are they, w w when they have an opportunity to just blow their stack, are they remembering, God, give me the patience I need to deal with this person right now? Um, you know, you're tempted to look at something that you shouldn't look at. God, give me my mindset that I'm living for eternity. I cannot be living for the flesh. I cannot be living <clears throat> for the temporal. Okay, the reality of the judgment. Each and every Christian, we've already cleared this, has an exit interview after leaving earth. Many Christians, after the joy of the, of the parousia and the rapture and being resurrected out of your box, uh, you will be in shock when you discover that at the Bema seat, uh, you enter eternity with nothing that shows faithfulness for your stewardship for the Savior. For we must all appear before the tribunal seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Good, reward. Bad, lose the reward. So run to win the prize, as Apostle Paul knew his end was near. I mean, Paul's in prison for the second time, um, and they, these are not like the prisons today here in America. I mean, these are just rat-infested cells. I mean, they just, they're just stank stuff. And so, but in that, he could say to Timothy, but you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations. Remain calm. Don't freak out. Don't panic. Jesus is still on the throne. Endure hardships. Do the work of an evangelist and discharge all your duties of your ministry. You know, I, the word discharge, to completely accomplish, to carry out fully, to perform one's complete duty. And, you know, Paul is, is know his, his time is about up. And he's trying to encourage Timothy, run as hard as I've run. Be faithful to discharge everything you do. Now, Timothy was one of the elders at the church in Ephesus. So, I mean, he had a lot of, lot of problems, a lot of issues to deal with. But Paul's last words, I'm being poured out and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And why did Paul keep fighting? Because the prize awaits me a crown of righteousness. I mean, that was his motivation. There's nothing wrong to have motivation to win when it comes to eternity. What's wrong is that if our motivation is to win temporally and that 
overwhelms us. That becomes so consuming to us. But this is where Paul is saying, put your energies and emphasis on eternal. And winning the, winning the prizes, there's no, no problem. What are the prizes? <clears throat> you know, you go to the carnival and you see all the things, you know, the little stuffed animals displayed. Not like that here. Um, the way I see it is there's seven eternal crowns, then there are seven eternal honors. These are what's available. <clears throat> Uh, there's some caveats to them here. So press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus. God wants you to be an overcomer. He wants you to be a winner. And so do you not know that in a race all the runners w r run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way as to win the prize. Now, thankfully, you're not competing against me. I'm not competing against you. It's not a knockdown drag out who gets the crown or who gets an honor. No, it's not that. It's just based on how well, how faithfully you did your service to God. So the seven crowns, I'll go through these and we'll close it on up here. Um, there is the eternal crown. And, and this one is for persistently and patiently seeking Christ. This is for the person with, who has had tremendous obstacles, uh, tremendous distractions, tremendous temptations, but you persistently pursue your, your walk relationship with God. I love this that this would be the first one because this one is all about uh, just your walk, your, your, your walk with God. I mean, I, I hope, I hope, well, let me say it this way. Sometimes my life can get kind of dry in the week. And, and I know what the problem is. I'm not drawing closer to God in the Word, or there's just been huge problems that have just exploded, and I haven't come to the Savior to, to, to lay the burden at His feet. And so, but I want to be one who can win this crown. This one is available to every single person, 1 Corinthians 9, 25. The crown of rejoicing, this one, it, it seems to be emphasized. Now, if you go to these scriptures, you can pull the context, but it's not going to say the crown of rejoicing needs to be filled by doing this, this, and this. Do these three things, and you'll win. It, it's not quite like that. Um, it seems to be much more um, th the Lord will evaluate you in those areas of quality, your motivation, and were you faithful. The crown of rejoicing uh, tends to be one for evangelizing and discipling others, helping others mature, helping others how to study the Bible, reaching the lost for Christ. Chris and I were driving back home. Uh, earlier this week and um, you know you see these people begging for money on all these street corners and w one guy was there and um, got to know him pretty good you know because we that was a long light and so you know got to help him out sometimes <laughs> it's real long light when people start honking behind you get moving on but but he was a nice guy it was a uh, he was I thought he might have been a veteran but he said he wasn't but he was hoping to get on some um, anyways but but the thing was is that Sometimes I don't know how to help those people. And I saw one guy, pull, he, he pulled right in front of me, crossed over, and he rolled down his window, and I think he's going to give him some money, and he gives him a brown bag. And, and you know, said, well, I didn't hear what he said, but, uh, you know, here's a brown bag here, you know, God bless you or whatever. And, when, when the, and then I, his wife was there too, the guy, the guy, or a girl was there, so she tore the bag open probably to see if it's money or something, I guess, I don't know. But it was a juice box, it was a sandwich thing. I just thought, you know, I can't help everybody, but something like that is not a bad idea. But anyways, so I, you could put a track in it as well. But anyways, First Thessalonians 2.19. Crown of righteousness, loving and living for his parousia. In other words, are you motivated realizing that Christ is coming back and whether he comes back in our lifetime or our kids' or grandkids' lifetime, I want that to be a, a, a motivating uh, passion in my heart, 2 Timothy 4.8. Uh, now, the crown of life seems to be a part A, part B. I, I think that it could be two distinct crowns here, but they're both called the crown of life. First one is persevering under difficult and very hard troubles, James 1.12. Um, in a situation that is horrible, but you, you're pressing on. You're, you're not throwing in the white towel. Um, health challenges that you're just not giving up on. It's beating you up, but you're not going to give up on it. Relationships on the, on the, not going good, but you're going you're gonna to do what you can to make that relationship work, whatever relationship it is. And Crystal and I are not having problems, so it's, I'm not talking about me and Crystal. <laughs> <clears throat> the crown of life part two is being faithful uh, during the affliction, even unto death. Um, I think a lot of people will, will win that one for sure 
because we're all going to die. But can you be faithful with the with the the, the giftings God has given you? Um, you know, there's really no retirement for the Christian per se. The only retirement is when your heart stops. That's pretty much retirement there. Um, so be faithful for as God has given you the time and, and your energy to do. Um, now, this one is limited. The, the crown of glory is limited. You can't, only certain people can earn this one. And this one is a faithful and loyal shepherd of the flock. So this would probably be for elders, pastors, who have been faithful to take care of the, the sheep that aren't that smart. They, <laughs> these are the shepherds that look over, that pray over, that are constantly uh, teaching, feeding, helping, but but this is this is limited. First uh, Peter five four. This is limited to those that have that qualification and that lead and uh, faithfully guide a flock. The last crown, of course, is you can't earn it all because Christ already took it for you. Praise God. Mm-hmm. The crown of thorns. Jesus wore the crown of thorns. John nineteen two. Okay, we're doing good. One more slide here. Um, this is the this is be eternal honors and. We'll get into this one a little bit more when we get back into Revelation. <clears throat> um, because those churches in Revelation were, I mean, were real churches, but also the, the book is, is applicable to any generation. And those churches, I think, are really going to be indicative of what the churches will be like as we enter the 70th week. You're going to have some great churches. You're going to have some lukewarm churches. You're going to have some pathetic churches. And a- every one of them have the 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 challenge to become an overcomer to become a nikeo that's what the greek word nike that means to be an overcomer that's why they put it on the tennis shoes nike means to be an overcomer i mean you don't want to put the greek word for loser on your shoe or something like that so that's why they put nike on shoes and that's where the brand name came from so you have the ephesus honor um this is this seems to be a person that has maintained that intimate walk with God perfectly every day? No, I don't think that's the qualification, but it's, it's been the heartbeat of your life. Sure, there's been some dry seasons. Sure, there's been some detours along the way, but it, it is, is your passion to stay close with Christ and enjoy that intimacy? If you do, the honor is to enjoy the tree of life. Um, the Smyrna honor, this would be a faithful martyr. That, that poor church was, was being beat up left and right. They were losing members of their congregation due to martyrdom, and they will be spared from the second death, which is the lake of fire. But th- there's, there must be something very special about uh, that Smyrna honor. The Pergamum honor, loyal witness. Can, can you be a loyal witness? Can you be a faithful witness? Um, in regards to where you work, your business, your home, your friends, can you maintain a, a, a witness that people know you, your life is different? Or would they be shocked to see you here on Sunday morning? Well, I didn't know you were even went to First Baptist. Um, and then there'll be a special favor with a new name connected to that, Thyatira Honor, Holding Truth, and God will give you the ability to rule and reign the nation. So hold the truth, you don't let it go. Now, if you're in a good church, and truth is being taught, it's fairly easy to hold to the truth. What the, tr- the struggle comes in is when um, deceivers can come in and start to try to steal away the flock. In fact, that's what Paul warned the Ephesus church to be so careful about. Um, and we'll dig into that because it was so- I can see why Ephesus lost their first love. And I think a lot of us slip into that Ephesus mindset a lot. Um, fifth one, the Sardis honor walking worthy. Um, again, some of these, I'm not quite sure how the Lord will judge all these, but you could probably tell if you're walking worthy. Are you, com- are you compromising your thought life? Are you compromising in er- other areas? Or are you walking worthy with your relationship with God? You'll be secure before the Lord. Six one, the Philadelphia honor. Um, this seems to be one where if God, God opens up an opportunity for you, you are, are, courageous and faithful enough to step out and do what God has for you. There'll be a special honor with God. And lastly, there is the Laodicea honor. Do you have a humble heart? Oh, how important it is to be humble with everything that we do for God, to make sure that he's, he's receiving the glory, make sure my motive is right and everything I do. And we have the right to sit on the throne with him. 
And then that is what I see as the seven eternal crowns and the seven eternal honors. And it's interesting, Jesus, as things wrap up with that, he says, I am coming soon, Revelations 3.11, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. It's like, wow, it's good to be reminded of that. The crowns of the honor. So when we talk about spiritual gifts and living your life faithfully, these are the rewards that will be given out. I mean, if, if we had pictures of rewards, it, sometimes it, it helps you to focus in on uh, the goal a little bit better. But you have to study the Bible to see what these pictures are and to see what, what these are. So that way it keeps them in the front of your mind and you realize what you're living this life for for Christ. Questions, comments? Remember, our crowns, honor, our rewards will, will show faithful stewardship on our part. And then we use those crowns and those honors to lay them before God as we worship him. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. I'm not saying you won't be able to worship if you don't have any crowns, not that at all. But it would be better for you to be able to have something to give back to the master. It's really what it's all about. And that goes back to that parable Jesus gave. When he came back, some of the servants had doubled it. Some of the servants had gotten more of it. And then one servant, he just didn't do anything. He just sat home every day watching TV and didn't worry about calling people or praying for people or sending out cards. Or he just. And then when Jesus came back, he gave him back his, his talent or his weight of, of money. And, boy, that, that servant didn't, didn't do well, didn't do well. All right. Michael, what I think about is that in heaven, without our sin nature, you know, I can see people with all these crowns, and I may not have one, but I'm not going to be envious no. or jealous of others that have what I don't have. No, I, I, I agree. I, I don't think it's going to be a question of that. And I, I don't think you're going to be walk people be walking around with all these crowns in their heads. <laughs> I mean, maybe in your back pocket. But, 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 he, but here's, here's the image of it, is that those that, that didn't have anything, those that didn't use their spiritual gifts, there will be regret. After that, tears wiped away, everything's, everything's good to go. But, I mean... Will I stand in heaven at the Bema seat and say, I wish I would have prayed more. I wish I would have stepped out a little more. I wish I would have trusted God and done this a bit more. I wish I would have called. I mean, I just think, I think at the judgment seat, I, I think it's going to be a time where there will be loss. And, and I, I'm sure we'll all lose somewhere along the line. None of us are perfect. But where's my heart at? Where's my heart at? To run as much as I can or to just slack it off till next Sunday and then wait till next Sunday, the next Sunday, and, and not invest your life into other people is what it's all about. So thanks for bringing that point up. I appreciate that. I think of, um, and I can't remember where it is, but it's, it's just prove yourself worthy. Just prove yourself worthy. I don't oh. know where it is. Um, that's, <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of what I wake up with. That's good. Yeah, it's Timothy. Where, where uh, Paul is addressing Timothy to, 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 to be faithful, to, to prove yourself to be faithful. And again, I mean, we, we can look to the disciples and see how they, how they labored and how they served, and they were just following the, the, the role that Christ had given them, that they had seen him do. You know? And in fact, in that parable of Zacchaeus, right after that happens, Jesus makes this statement, for the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so that little gem is tucked right in there with the Zacchaeus event in Luke 19. And it's just like, wow, you know, our life is to be one of service to others. Thank you for bringing that up. And Michael, also just remembering that, uh, just by faith, believing that God's empowering this, you know, because if I didn't really believe that, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> no, that's and that's the beauty of it is that the, the, not only does the Spirit of God give you giftings, but He will empower, lead you, guide you, prompt you. Now, how do I respond to that prompting? You know, that's that's the key. Uh, thank you. That's good. Very good point. Michael, I also yeah. think, um, as far as like if God gives us a gift of giving to others, that's 
interesting point when I get to him. Um, it's not just for him to, to see that we're using our gifts. It's for us to realize how much he's giving us back as a result of doing it. I mean, I've got a friend that I will not say her name. She'd kill me. But she's got tons of money. And I was needing something for one of my former special ed kids this week. Tapping down. Just, right. You know. And her main line to me every time is, come by and pick up a check. Hmm. And when I did go by and pick up several hundred dollar check for different things that she's right. given me in the past that I never asked for, she's just all giggly like a five-year-old. <laughs> I just love doing this for step kids. I just love No, that's, and, that's right on. It's right on. And then she said, but don't tell people I'm doing this because that's not why I'm doing it. And it's things like that, I think. Yeah, we'll we'll touch on that next next week too. That if if you're ministering in the area that God's gifted you, and we'll go through all oh, about twenty of the gifts, nineteen to twenty of the gifts, um, you, you will have energy in that area of your gifting that you wouldn't normally have, um, and so it'll be an area that that you find strength to do, you find joy in doing. Um, and you see good results in doing. I mean, you know, if if I if 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 you don't have a gift, uh, it, it it can be very obvious very quickly. I mean, you know, if we only had two people in the class, I'd probably just say, well, let's move on. I'm just not a teacher. But you know, the the beauty is is that God will give fruit through your life. Remember, it is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. I mean, He wants our lives to be fruitful. He wants us to. Be, and, and what is the fruit? It's the it's the impact we have in one another's lives. That is that's the blessing there. Anyone else? Michael, I just yeah. want to say you you may mention that some churches don't teach on spiritual gifts, and to tag on to that, I believe that there are some churches who don't really talk about the bema seat uh, of judgment, and I know I've had an experience with an individual who believed that there would be no regret or tears in heaven. I challenged that because of the Bama seat of judgment and asked her to reconsider. That's a good point. Because there will be regret on our part when we get to heaven and realize that we have disappointed the Lord or we have not used our spiritual gifts. I, I think at the judgment seat is, is, where, is where that regret will be felt because everything is being laid out, your motives, your quality, were you even faithful in it? So everything's going to be laid out, and it's between you and Jesus. Now, I don't know if there's a big screen. People can see it. I don't know. And I, I don't know how Jesus can do it for billions of people. He'll figure that all out at the same time. But I, I do know that if you're going to look through my life, my motives, and my stewardship, there's going to be some great Smiles, there's going to be a couple frowns along the way, too. So, um, yeah, and then after that, we don't have to worry about it because new, new assignments will be given, and you'll have a glorified body, a spiritual body, hallelujah, so you won't be in pain most of the time. So it'll be a whole lot different serving the Lord. But um, I think at the Bema seat, there will be regrets because Paul says, you know, you're going to either win the reward or lose the reward. Jesus tells us. <coughs> Yeah, I, I can't imagine someone sitting at the Bema seat, seeing the scars in Jesus' wrist, hands, uh, and, and not, not feeling that I could have done more or I could have done something as opposed to I didn't, I didn't serve in people's lives. I, I didn't let the love of Christ motivate me to, to be walking and ministering to help people. So I, I just can't imagine that. And, you know, will, will, will we have all of our memories? Well, sure, because you're going to have everything that he's going to go through. So you'll, you'll have all the memories of everything, probably a lot better than what I remember now. But all right, we better wrap it up. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for this, this challenging subject. But thank you, God, for giving us the wisdom to know that we can labor in love to bring glory to you by serving one another. We give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.